You're listening to KSQD Santa Cruz presenting Exploring Santa Cruz. I'm here with Nancy Falstick and Itzel Sanchez. We will be discussing the work of Regeneración Pajaro Valley Climate Action and La Vida Verde. Nancy Falstick founded Regeneración Pajaro Valley Climate Action in 2016 with a small group of Pajaro Valley residents. Now Regeneración's first director, Nancy was motivated to work for climate action and resilience upon realizing the plight that younger generations, including her 11-year-old daughter, will face. Her goal was for everyone in the Pajaro Valley to become fully aware of the reality of climate change and to move together to address the causes and strive for justice. She brought to us Itzel Sanchez. She is a sophomore at Pajaro Valley High School who's passionate about environmental justice. She is the founder and current leader of La Vida Verde, a club dedicated to taking action now to mitigate climate change and protect the living environment of the earth. Welcome, Nancy. Welcome, Itzel. Thank you. Muchas gracias. It's great to be here. Yes. And Itzel will listen to us in English, and she will do the speaking in Spanish, and Nancy uh, will translate or actually interpret for her. Let me first give you the information about, you can possibly call in, 900-5773, 831 area code, 900-5773, if you have a question for Nancy or Itzel. Please also know that you can find more information on Regeneration Pajaro Valley, all one word, dot O-R-G. Regeneration Pajaro Valley, dot O-R-G. If you have information that you would like to share or want, you can reach them at info at regenerationpajarovalley.org. Contact them by phone, 831-288-7755, or visit them at 23 East Beach Street, Suite 104 in Watsonville. Well, let's get started, Nancy. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what your connection is to Santa Cruz County? Sure. So I've lived in different places in Santa Cruz County for over 30 years, um, with most of that time being in the Pajaro Valley, where I worked as a bilingual preschool teacher and later kindergarten teacher. Great. Itzel, what is your connection to Pajaro Valley High School as well as Santa Cruz County? Bueno, pues yo ya tengo un poco más de tres años que llegué a Watsonville. Yo vengo desde México y soy una estudiante en Pajaro Valley. I came from Watsonville about three years ago and have been a student at Pajaro Valley High School. So my first question is, I'm hearing climate change, but I also hear the word climate emergency. Can you tell us a little bit about why people would consider the situation we are right now in emergency? Bueno, pues... Tan solo el hecho de que muchas especies están muriendo, se están incendiando muchos lugares. Species are going extinct. There are huge fires in many places. Y probablemente en unos años ya ni siquiera podamos vivir a gusto en nuestro mundo. It seems like within um, sh a short time, a number of years, we might not even be able to keep living on this planet. Entonces, si creen que el que su casa se esté quemando, el que en unos años no podamos vivir, no es una emergencia, entonces no sé qué lo es. So if you don't feel like that your house being on fire and the possibility that the world might not be livable in a short period of time, if that's not an emergency, then what is? Thank you. Thank you for that. History of regeneración. Did you start it calling it regeneración or did you call it first regeneration or... Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I and a group of friends had started organizing around climate change back in about 2012. Um, once I kind of connected the dots and realized that I was parenting a child who could potentially be alive in 2100, which was the kind of magical year that scientists kept pointing to. Um, mm -hmm. So we started showing films and started a mailing list. We called ourselves Watsonville Climate Action Network for a while. Um, and then it wasn't until later in 2015 and 2016 that after starting to talk to a lot of people in different agencies, organizations, et cetera, we decided there really was a, the need for a new organization um, to bring together the issues of justice and the issues related to the environment, which are so closely connected um, based on a long history of exploitation of land, stealing of resources, stealing of people, 
um, that's kind of what's led us to the brink of utter destruction today. So again, it seemed like the organizing that was happening was mostly not at all based in Watsonville, um, and it was not based in the majority population of Watsonville. And so our intent from the beginning was to build an organization that would be representative of the community, that would be basing solutions and looking at impacts um, based on people who've done the least to cause the problem, but who are being disproportionately negatively affected by the problem, um, which in the Pajaro Valley is, is farm worker families primarily. Um, and we you know, worked for a while to come up with a name. We wanted a name that would work well in both English and Spanish. And then we ultimately decided to um, mostly call ourselves Regeneración, but then use Pajaro Valley Climate Action as well. Regeneration of both the earth as well as the people in our outlook on how we treat each other and how we treat the land. Exactly. Yeah. We thought it had great imagery associated with it. I like, I like on your website when you say, we work with community partners to empower everyone in the Pajaro Valley to respond locally to the global challenge of a changing climate. I think that's a very great synopsis. What is your vision? Our vision is for everyone to thrive in harmony with the natural world. We think it's possible to, that there are enough resources in the world for everyone to thrive. We're certainly not at that position now, but that's where we would like to get to. Yo, que soy la creadora de mi club, pienso que como yo lo empecé, fue simplemente hacer algo, hacer un cambio y no quedarme sentada sin. My purpose in forming my club, La Vida Verde, was um, to do something, to not just sit there and watch while things are happening, but to get active. I kind of like the, the term La Vida Verde, the, the green life, not the green, you know, the money, but the green life. You're for life. Not the greed, but life. Excellent. But I, I like that idea. Talking about farm workers, you know, I, as a teacher and as a principal in Bajaro Valley, I worked with students whose parents, and sometimes they too, work in the fields. Back then, I already felt that the impact on my students from the pesticides, from the weather, was already great. But I can imagine with the climate emergency, that you can inform us about what else is going on or what can they expect in, in, in the near future. Pues, en mi experiencia, tengo muchos amigos cercanos que sus papás, todos sus papás trabajan en los files y es bastante difícil porque a pesar de que estos años ha incrementado por mucho el calor, el sol está cada vez más fuerte, I have many close friends whose parents work in the fields, and even just in the last few years, they're noticing a real change in weather patterns where the temperatures are going up. Y eso pues les afecta mucho, además de los pesticidas, que también son muy dañinos, tanto para el clima, tanto para el mundo, tanto para las personas. Mm -hmm. So the rising temperatures are affecting people, and then, of course, the pesticides that they're exposed to are a real threat to themselves as well as to the environment and other animals and life. And one note about pesticides is that um, they are more potent in higher temperatures. They are. Um, and, and they're also petroleum-based, so there's many reasons why pesticides are dangerous to continue using. En la salud principalmente, yeah. sus papás... Puede que les afecte, tal vez ahorita no les está afectando en gran manera, pero en un futuro puede afectar mucho tanto a sus papás como a los niños que también trabajan a veces. Yeah, so it, the health effects are the most strongest and um, most serious in terms of all of this, both from the pesticides as well as the rising temperatures. And people may not feel all of that now, but over time it's going to have a cumulative effect. First of all, I want to congratulate you on your website. Um, I went to your website, Thank you. got an enormous amount of information, and also found that you have done, together with Cal State Monterey Bay, research on the impact of climate change on people working in agriculture. Can you explain a little bit more about what the findings are, how this came about? I mean, how did you get the university to, to work with you? Yeah, so to set the context, um, back in 20, um, early 2017, we chose just a few initial pilot projects to get started with. But then as a small group, we thought, hmm, there's so many things you could do related to the climate. What do we pick to work on? 
And so we decided to do some community-based research to listen to a larger number of people in our community to hear both how they're being affected by environmental changes as well as what kinds of initiatives or solutions would be of interest or seemed in their opinion, to be most beneficial to them and to our community. Um, so at that point, we launched a survey, grassroots survey. We got a bunch of volunteers to help. We did um, have it overseen at that point by a professor from San Jose State. Um, and that survey gave us some really interesting results, which we were continuing to use in different ways and continuing to um, base future projects out of. Um, so the connection with CSUMB came a little bit later, mm -hmm. where I uh, made contact with a professor who was really interested in the work that we're doing, and she happened to be teaching a research and methods class. And so she and her class took our results from that original survey and did further analysis of it. So they ran, you know, kind of different questions, looked demographics in different ways and asked different kinds of questions. And um, that was a valuable learning experience for the students, as well as really helpful for us to get more information. And so out of that, um, we produced a fact sheet and then a policy analysis, um, kind of in conjunction with this professor and, and a couple of her students who were really good writers. And one of the key findings related to agriculture and uh, agricultural workers um, was that 74% of the agricultural workers who identified as agricultural workers in the study reported that they themselves or close family or friends were being negatively affected by extreme heat mm -hmm. at the workplace. Um, and uh, compared to non-agricultural workers, it was a lot lower. So that was one clear result showing you know, the environmental injustice of people just by virtue of the type of work that they're doing, suffering from the extreme weather conditions. And one thing that in particular I want to highlight around that is there are growing numbers of acres that are planted in raspberries and other cane berries in the Pajaro Valley. And if you've driven around the area, you'll see that they're under hoop houses, um, which are plastic. And temperatures get easily 10 to 15 degrees hotter under the plastic. And so a 70 degree day can become an extreme heat day for agricultural workers. So you said policy changes, policy changes for, for you or also for our elected officials? Because I can imagine that if the impact is such that people are going to be overcome by the heat, is, uh, is there going to be any changes in laws on the amount of breaks people need? What happens if it is so hot it's really unbearable? Would people be allowed to stay home? Yeah. My understanding is that there are laws in place. There's laws about having shade. There's laws about um, supplying water and providing water and giving rest breaks and things like that. But the word that we hear from workers is because agricultural workers are still paid by the piece, there's many people who choose to forego taking breaks, choose to forego drinking enough water because they don't want to then spend time going to the bathroom oh, right. um, and they don't want to be sent home from work because they're so dependent on the income. I mean, it's a really horrible situation that people are in where they're jeopardizing their own health. And we had through our survey, we heard um, cases, you know, stories about people experiencing heat stress, having to go to the hospital, fainting. Um, thankfully, there's been no death that I'm aware of in Santa Cruz County due to heat, but there have been of farm workers in other places. Um, and so because of that, we're moving forward um, with a couple of things. One is launching a heat stress awareness and prevention campaign. And we want to at least make sure that agriculture workers are aware of how to take care of themselves, like to avoid drink, drinking caffeine, which is an issue because many agriculture workers, they're working 10, 12 hour days, they live on energy drinks like right. Red Bull kind of thing. And, and that um, is worse. That makes you more dehydrated. Right. In terms of policymakers, we've been really working at building relationships mm -hmm. with people so that then we can help people think about policies that might need to be changed for the future. But the issues are all interconnected and the issues are huge. I mean, the economic injustice is the underpinning of so much of this. And there's such a need to return the wealth that was stolen from communities over centuries um, and give a fair and decent standard of living back to all people. Did you want to add anything to that? What do you hear from your friends and the, the friends' parents? Do they feel that there is an injustice that they have to work in order to make some money and that's why they're putting their, their health in danger? 
pues sí, sí he escuchado mucho sobre eso y obviamente los papás o incluso ellos mismos piensan que es muy injusto cómo los ponen a trabajar. Son muy malas las condiciones. Pero... I've heard a lot about this. I've heard um, the parents talking about how unfair it is that they have to work in the conditions they're working in. Pero pues en sí no hay mucho que pueden hacer porque muchos de ellos necesitan, es de donde están tomando el dinero. But they feel like there's really nothing they can do because they're dependent on the limited income that they do get. Es su recurso de dinero, de comida, así que... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's their resource that pays for their food. Yeah. So I'm thinking of that possibly there needs to be a basic salary for people working in the fields, that in case there is, you know, there needs to be some kind of communal pot where we say it is too hot to work, here is a certain amount of money, because this is reality. Because basically what's going to happen is that if people are so stressed out from the climate, their productivity is not going to be very high. And it may, you know, depend on, on their livelihood, but also it may be that at some point we're not going to have to work. Now I hear that we have a phone call, so I'm going to put the phone caller on. Can Hello. you hear us? Hello. You're on the air. Can you tell us your name? Yes, this is Randa Salak. I'm very interested in the work of regeneración. I'm sure I'm not saying it right. I've also worked a little bit with the Center for Farm Worker Families, and I think, Matilda, when you started to give the introduction, you said that Nancy's uh, group works with them in some way. I think Ana Lopez is doing amazing work protecting farm workers, and I like to ask Nancy and the other woman who's there, how have they been working with the Center for Farm Worker Families, and is there a way that people could support that work? Great, Nancy. Mm, thank you, Randa. We participated in one of Dr. Lopez's farm worker reality tours last summer um, to talk a little more specifically about the effects of um, immigration and climate change and the effects on farm workers in the Pajaro Valley of the changing climate. Um, I would highly recommend for anybody who's listening to consider going on one of the reality tours. It's an opportunity to um, hear directly from some people about how they arrived in the United States to see how strawberries are picked, you know, kind of the the um, skill that's involved in sorting and picking and cleaning the fields as they go. Um, and then a dinner is provided at the home of a farm worker who prepares the meal herself, and you get to, a chance to see the horrible and expensive living conditions um, for farm workers in the Pajo Valley. And so in order for people who would like to be on a tour like that, how would they contact Ana Lopez? Yeah, um, her website, I believe, is Center farmworkerfamilycenter.org or centerforfarmworkerfamilies.org. But people mm -hmm. could go to your website. Get you could to, also write to us. Yeah, mm -hmm. info, info at valley.org and then you will Certainly. be able to give them the information. Certainly. Yeah, and we've collaborated with Dr. Lopez in different ways. We did, uh, we called it a Climate of Hope Forum to share the results of our survey a couple of years ago, and um, she was really helpful at Uh, recommending a couple of um, farm working women that she knows to speak about conditions in the fields. And that was a really powerful event. One of the things we try to do is bring together people who aren't normally in the same um, space together to hear from each other about yeah. their experiences. Does that answer your question, Renda? I think so. It does. Okay, good. It does. And I'm also, I'm, I went on one of those reality tours and it was really eye opening, very much. But I was more specifically wondering about how those two organizations can work together to actually focus public attention on the situation that these people who are picking all of our food are living in. I know it's really bad in Watsonville right now. Yeah, that, it's a wonderful suggestion, and we do try to keep working with as many partners as we can to really amplify what we're doing. Um, and as we get more resources, we're able to, to put together as well more co collaboration. So thank you real, very much for that suggestion. Thank you, Randa. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Itzel, um, I'm very interested in the involvement of young people, your generation. I once was young, and I was very mad at my you know, older generation in the 70s that they hadn't done enough yet. Do you get the same feeling, or is it, is it even more urgent now? Pienso que sí es más urgente porque... Ya ahorita ya estamos a poco tiempo, ya no es como que, oh, tal vez en unos cuantos años que no sabemos, pero ahorita yeah, ya I hay fecha. 
I think the situation is even more urgent now. It's not like we could say, oh, you know, maybe in a few years I'll do something. Entonces, pienso que sí es más la presión en nosotros. We feel a lot of pressure on ourselves. Porque nosotros somos los que podemos hacer el cambio. Because we're actually the ones who can make this change. Nosotros vamos a ser los que vamos a vivir ese tiempo, vamos a vivir todos esos problemas. We're the ones who are going to live with the problems that result. Now, you were involved in the September 20th uh, demonstrations. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Nosotros hicimos en nuestra escuela algo que le llamamos die-in. At our school, we held a die-in on the day of September 20th. Uh -huh. Ahí lo que quisimos mostrar es, muchos nos tiramos en el suelo como mostrando los animales que están muriendo. So a lot of us laid down in the courtyard um, and represented animals that are dying. Eh, este día fue muy especial porque miré el apoyo de muchos estudiantes. This was a very special day because I could see the support of many, many students. Mm -hmm. Muchos hicieron discursos y hablaron sobre lo que sentían y lo que querían hacer. Many wrote essays and talked about what they wanted to do. Entonces pienso que no soy la única que está preocupada. Toda nuestra generación está preocupada y estamos queriendo hacer un cambio. So I can see that I'm not the only one who's concerned. There's lots of us that are concerned, and together we can work for change. Talking about your generation, but then we have the wider community. How are you getting, Nancy, how do you get people in Watsonville and hopefully around the county involved in seeing that there is a climate emergency? It's a really good question, and I ask myself every day why more people don't seem to be acting like there's an emergency. I often feel like I'm living in a dual reality where it's kind of all that I know and what I'm thinking about and working on, and then I go out anywhere else, and it just seems like people are kind of going along with their lives. So it's, it's a very strange time right now, but I do think there's lots of reasons why it's hard for people to exactly. notice what's happening. It's hard to face what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's hard to figure out... Um, alternatives to, you know, we're kind of trapped in the lifestyles of the consumer society. And so all of that can be difficult and in the way. But some of the things that we've been doing with Regeneración is creating kind of a title or a position that we call ambassadors. And we um, ask people to take our infographic. We have um, it in either English or Spanish and kind of explains the origins of the climate crisis and goes through, you know, difficult things that are happening with that. And then on the back, it has a number of solutions that individuals can start engaging in by themselves or collectively. And so we ask people to simply talk about, take this paper and then talk about it with their family, their friends, people at work. And so we've had somebody working in a mushroom factory share that with many workers there. We had somebody who was working in a packing plant over the summer get into conversation Catherine Hayhoe is a um, kind of a famous evangelical scientist, um, climate scientist, and she has said one of the most important things to do at this time to stop climate change is to talk about it. So I encourage everybody to simply bring it up into conversation, ask people what they think, find a way to link a person's um, you know, personal life with climate change. I noticed that you kind of have a list of what people can do. And the first thing you said, realize that ch uh, climate change is real. It's caused by people. Experts agree it's happening. It's harmful to people, not just polar bears. There are solutions. Delaying action will mean worse outcomes, as Itzel told us. Time for all hands on deck, says Itzel, and I agree with you. Together, we can develop solutions that will benefit us all. What will you do to protect life on Earth? That's both of yours thing. Now, we have another call, so let's get that caller online. Caller, what's your name? Uh, Tammy Harkins. Hi, Tammy. What's your Before question? That, my question is um, related to what Nancy just talked about, and it's all even um, in terms of the dual reality. I feel the same way as a teacher And I just think as Australia is burning and just all these things are happening, I just wonder what role education can play in this and why, you know, even education isn't doing much, you know, much less the media. And, you know, if students have ideas about how to present curriculum or demand curriculum that would help create change and also give solutions to students to start moving forward on. So if they have any ideas about it, I'd like to know. I think 
uh, it's climate change l links to everything. So I think it's uh, wonderful for anybody in any position. It can be from the student point of view. It can be from a teacher point of view to simply make those connections um, while teaching, you know, while discussion is going on about whatever subject. Because when you think about it, everything takes place in a climate and that climate has shifted. And so therefore all human activity is going to be affected by this changing climate. And so I always say that you don't even need to sort of think about this as something else you have to take on. You just have to make that connection and integrate um, a, a long-term view of how to protect and sustain life on, on earth with whatever the, the, your particular passion is or area of focus. So you can integrate in art, um, you can think about athletics, the effect, etc. What about you at Sal? Yo concuerdo con totalmente con lo que están diciendo de que la, está pasando todo esto y pareciera que nadie lo ve. I totally agree. It, it always seems to me like all of this is happening and people don't see it. Si yo escucho sobre todos estos incendios como los que están pasando en Australia, las inundaciones, las extinciones, todo eso. If I hear about things like these huge fires in Australia or the floods that are happening um, or animal extinction, Yo en verdad me asusto y quiero hacer algo. I get so frightened and I want to do something. Well, thank you. Thank you both. You really inspired me. Uh, but, you know, there's so much more to talk about. But I am going to send people to your website one more time. It is regenerationpajarovalley.org. Phone number? 288-7755 in the 831 area code. And if you want to visit them at 23 East Beach Street, Suite 104 in Watsonville. I want to thank Itzel Sanchez and Nancy Falstich for coming here. I know you have so much. There is so much on your website. I hope people visit your website. It looks beautiful. It's in Spanish and in English. And it has an incredible amount of information. And unfortunately, we ran out of time. So thank you for the callers, and uh, thank you, Nancy and Itzel. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Gracias por la gran oportunidad de hablar con los demás. Again, you are tuned to KSQD Santa Cruz, and you just listened to Exploring Santa Cruz with me, Matilda Rand, host, and Nancy Folstig, and Itzel Sanchez from Regeneración Pajaro Valley Climate.